Hello and welcome to the Finance and Legal Afternoon Workshop. Um, I hope you're all doing well and had a good day and can uh, keep your attention going this afternoon with some interesting discussion around two of the, the areas that really underpin the business and uh, of football and the sport of football. That without the uh, legal and regulatory structures and the finance that underpins the business, the f sport would not be able to operate effectively. Um, the afternoon session, uh, we're going to have reduced breaks because we slightly overran, uh, as you would have been aware for the, uh, earlier today. So we're going to, if I can ask you not to leave the room, if you want to stay for the, la the latter two sessions, and just grab a quick coffee, um, and then get get, your, get back to your seats, and so we can try to to get the agenda back on on track. Um, my name is Sean Cottrell. I'm the CEO of Law in Sport. We're the destination for your sports law content. We provide expert opinion and analysis on legal issues and regulatory issues in sport. We're the host of the afternoon sessions. But to start off this afternoon, we have some experts to talk about wealth management and the use of image rights from Guernsey. Uh, to my left, we have David Evans, director of Collius Creel and Paul Blackwell, Director of Confiance Limited, who are going to discuss image rights, registration, and finance structures of image rights in Guernsey. Over to you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming. So, without further ado, let's, um, I'm going to talk about what it is uh, that we can register in Guernsey, how we do it, and what it all means uh, and Paul will be talking about wealth management and uh, all that that entails and uh, pension planning. So, if we look at uh, the general position in the UK, let's get the right slide. Right. So, as it stands in the UK today, there is a complete lack of consistency when it comes to image rights. In fact, there is no such thing in the law as an image right in the UK. Surprisingly enough, despite the fact that uh, clearly you pay tax on it, you transact over it, and deals are done every day on it. Now, last year there was a Rihanna case, which I'll come to later in a bit more detail, but that basically gave us a very sort of useful snapshot of, of how the courts felt about image, image rights. And interestingly enough, um, HMRC, a couple of weeks ago now, but they came out with... Uh, a manual update to their CGT manual. And basically what that encapsulated in a very neat kind of step-by-step -step way was to restate this position and to say, firstly, there's no such thing as image rights in the UK. And secondly, they actually adopted a, a, a methodology, if you like, to, to suggest what it actually was that is in the UK. And their take on it was quite interesting. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this because it's readily available online uh, on, on HMRC's website. But basically what they're saying is if you transact over image rights, what you're actually transacting over, if they're UK rights, is basically goodwill. And if you are transferring goodwill in the UK out maybe to a, a third-party company, the only way you can do that validly is to transfer a business along with that goodwill because the only way goodwill can be generated is through business activity. Therefore, if you are not transferring a business as a whole and you're only doing the goodwill on its own, that transaction will be voided. And I think that's a very important thing just to bear in mind as we go through what we're talking about today. So. There is no statutory registrable right anywhere else in the world apart from Guernsey. What does this mean? Well, just as uh, contractually in the UK, we obviously split uh, contracts into playing, performance income, and image rights income. This gives you a much clearer definition of what it is you're talking about. Uh, it can give substance to uh, split revenue employment contracts. And what it does is give you much more clarity than purely contractual licensing and protection will give you. So, the Guernsey right is the first of its kind anywhere in the world. Other countries have a, a, a kind of rag bag of rights, really, depending on which countries you're in. In Europe, typically privacy rights uh, play a part. If you're in the US, 
a right of publicity plays a part. But in none of those cases can you register them formally. The law protects from unauthorised commercial dealing. It doesn't protect against satire or commentary or news reporting. But if somebody takes somebody's image, utilises it to try and make money, then that will be actionable under the legislation. The law looks at a person or a personality, and a personality is a very widely defined uh, thing under the law. So whether it's a, a, an individual or a joint personality or a group, um, that can all be dealt with under the law. So it takes that personality right, and we associate images that are typical of that person and register them around that personality right. So this allows for flexibility, easy management. It allows you to manage a portfolio of registered rights just in the same way that you would do normal IP rights, trademarks, design rights, copyright. It allows you to deal with them all in the same way. And these rights can be owned by anybody anywhere in the world. So it doesn't matter if you have an existing company or an existing structure, or you want the player to own them themselves, or you want the club to own them. It doesn't matter. Anyone can own these. Because of that, you then have many uses for this. You can use it for wealth management, pension planning. You can use it just as a licensing vehicle. You can use it for succession planning on a personal level. And you've also got the potential enforcement. Or not. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Right. So, what can we register? So, just about anything that you can think about that represents a personality can be registered. And when we talk about image rights, it's really slight misnomer in a way because all that makes us think of is are still pictures. But an image right can be anything. It can be a video clip, it can be a voice clip, it can be a mannerism, a gesture, an avatar. Any of those things can be registered. The personality right, which is the core right, is a 10-year right, renewable. The, 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 the image rights that surround that personality are three-year rights, again, renewable. The reason for the difference in the, in the periods of registration is that typically images will come and go. Players or, or celebrities will make use of an image for maybe a short period of time, and then a new one will come along. Other images will be you know, mu much more sort of part of the, the ongoing registration process. But they can just be left to lapse as and when. Now, because they're on a formal register, you have clarity. Instead of wor worrying about the definition within a contract now, as in likeness, mannerisms, gestures, all the other things that we talk about contractually, they can be encapsulated in image 1.1 on a register. Makes it very, very clear what it is you're talking about. All the rights are renewable. You keep renewing them, it can be in perpetuity. Unlike a trademark, you don't have any use requirements. So whereas a trademark becomes vulnerable after five years for non-use, these don't suffer from that problem. You can assign them to anybody, you can license them to anybody, you can sub-license them to anybody. And typically for, for a personal registration, typical official fees and professional fees are going to cost 2,500 for an individual. So we think that makes it a very uh, cost-effective way of dealing with something for a 10-year period. I'm going to just talk briefly about the Rihanna and Topshop case from last year, simply because, like I said before, it's actually the first kind of restatement of where the UK is on image rights for a long, long time. Um, the background to this, uh, is basically that Topshop put a picture of Rihanna on a T-shirt. Uh, they paid the copyright owner to use that image. So the basic uh, premise, I suspect, from Topshop's position was that they were covered legally for that. They'd done all they needed to do to clear that image. Uh, Rihanna thought otherwise. She thought, hang on a minute, the fact that you're putting my image on a T-shirt suggests that there's some link between her and Topshop, and that fans would 
would also draw that conclusion. Now, as it happened, uh, Rihanna has uh, a whole bunch of trademarks in the UK, none of which have got anything to do with an image. They're her name, they're her logo, all the, all the usual things that you might imagine uh, a celebrity might have. The thing she did have, according to the judge, was a reputation in fashion. She was actually rumoured to be the next uh, face of Topshop, and she also has a clothing line with another retailer. So the judge actually gave it in Rihanna's favour. But the interesting thing about this is that what she was relying on was passing off, i.e. unregistered rights. To do that, you need a reputation. If you haven't got a reputation, you are not going to win at passing off. So if you're not Rihanna, if there's no link to fashion, you've got a problem. And this restatement of the position in the UK basically says, if you can get some registered rights, get them, use them, because they're going to help you in such a position if you're not Rihanna. It's quite an interesting case, that. So if you, uh, if you feel minded, look it up, read it, because it, it is quite entertaining. In terms of, of sport and planning for sport, uh, again, the flexibility allows for future planning. Uh, they can be used at a personal or a corporate level. So when we talk about these rights, they can be a player being the personality, they could be a club being the personality, it doesn't matter. When you've got a club, the constituent parts of that image right or that personality right can change. So as people come and go out of the club, the image rights associated with that club can be changed and keep it current. And it becomes a very smart way of being able to manage those rights and commercialising those rights. As I said before, there's no use requirement, so you haven't got the trademark problem. Uh, the pool of rights, as I mentioned, can be uh, mixed and matched, but they can also, in, the, in, in terms of a personal registration, they can change over the lifetime of that player. So when the player retires, maybe becomes a pundit, those images are going to change. And those image rights that they're contracted over are going to change. So it allows for, for longevity of rights management. And, and something, you know, Paul, Paul will talk at great, greater depth with the possibilities for the, the personal player there. So, to sum up, we're talking about personal branding here. Th th that's really what sport uh, at a high level has become. That th the stars of today and tomorrow are brand ambassadors of themselves these days. So whether it's at club level or, or national level, the one constant is that many of these people are actually becoming brands in their own right. By utilising a, a portfolio of registered rights, those, that, those, that brand portfolio of assets can be managed much in the same way that a corporate brand would, would be managed. And it allows for the licensing out of them, the assignment, and the longevity factor to be, to be added in there. We've also got the protection element. We've also got the ability that if somebody utilises that brand in the way that uh, is seen to be infringing, we have the ability to pursue them. But as a longer term strategy, we also have a wealth management planning opportunity here to look at these rights as assets and to exploit them in a way that really has not been done in a hugely sophisticated way before. So I will pass you on to Paul, who will go into that with uh, some more detail. <coughs> Thank you, David. So David's talked about the current state of, state of play with respect to image rights, um, whether in Guernsey or elsewhere. And as far as elsewhere, is, is, it's pretty clear that in other common law jurisdictions, which include the UK, image rights are best protected by a disparate body of publicity rights, which can give an individual only limited control and protection against infringement over their personal brand. Likewise, in civil law jurisdictions, uh, there are certain rights to privacy which can be used to enforce um, actions against infringement, but generally the 
op options available are not um, particularly wide ranging. Notwithstanding that, it's recognized in um, the UK and beyond that promotional and consultancy agreements do have significant independent value. And it's clear that sponsors will pay for the right to use a person's image in association um, with their product. Indeed, the Premier League player contract itself refers to this uh, in Clause 4. My apologies, I've just realised that I uh, had a technological breakdown there. Okay, so we're now on the same page. Um, before we go on to the commercial opportunities that are available um, with respect to image rights for clubs, players and sponsors, um, it's important to determine what exactly is it that we're dealing with here, either registered or unregistered. And I've used the an analogy of a salami. We can either assign the whole in respect of an image right to a structure or to a sponsor uh, or indeed to a club. Or we can take it slice by slice. We can carve up the image right into various component parts. So for example, we can carve up UK rights, which we may assign to one person or entity. We can carve out other territorial rights or indeed just bulk it all together and, and assign the rights to the rest of the world um, outside of a particular territory. There are exclusivity options. We can either assign an exclusive right or we can assign a non-exclusive right. We can assign rights in relation to footballing activities, for example, or indeed other activities. It's, it's an increasing trend now that we see ex-players go into other, um, other, other um, trades after they retire from kicking a ball, whether that's fashion, for example, or acting, or indeed punditry. And finally, we look at active rights versus passive rights. I think it's pretty clear that if somebody has a boots contract and is paid to wear the boots of a particular brand during the course of games and training, that's very much an active um, type of uh, uh, relationship that they have in terms of the, the sponsorship arrangement because they are uh, continually um, fulfilling their duties under the contract versus a more passive right, which might be, for example, turning up for a photo shoot to do a a marketing campaign or turning up in a video game studio to um, record some movements for a, for a computer game. All of these things need to be considered when defining the image rights strategy for both player, club and sponsor. So first of all, if we talk about commercialization of image rights by clubs and maximizing the commercial value. In terms of the approach, clubs should look at ascertaining what slices of their stable of players' image rights will help them maximize the commercial value um, to them and their sponsors. What they um, achieve by doing this is enhancing their brand value by taking image rights from players that are consistent with the club's commercial strategy and it helps them develop a clear vision of what is needed from their players during the contract negotiations. It may also facilitate direct engagement between players and sponsors and enhance value by compelling players to use sponsor products at club events and also preventing players from engaging formally with club sponsors competitors. If we look at a Premier League club car park, you will often find a vast array of high power performance sports cars. If we look at some of the clubs on the continent, you will find that players are compelled through their contracts to turn up to club events in specific brands of car which are supplied by club sponsors to all club events. It's that kind of engagement between club player and sponsor which image rights um, can, can enhance in terms of the relationship.
So we've already talked really about the opportunity to maximise commercial income for the club. Um, we've also um, talked about how this can lead on to sponsor protection. There's an interesting impact um, that could be had on the um, so-called wage cap and financial fair play if clubs, rather than engaging with sponsors and taking image rights on board themselves um, and, and being paid by sponsors themselves for the use of players' image rights, if we think about it in terms of turning it on its head, and whilst the club has an arrangement and a commitment with the sponsor to engage all of their players with the sponsor, that engagement between player and sponsor is actually personal. And all of this, of course, leads to an improvement in the negotiating position with the players by maximising funds available to um, the players for their services. So, in terms of the players, where do they fit in with all of this? Well, once the club strategy has been defined and it's been clearly laid out what image rights uh, or what, what image rights of the player have been carved out um, for use by the club and their sponsors, the, the player also has the opportunity to enhance his own brand value um, with supplementary but obviously not competing contracts. And in terms of structuring this, there are wide array of wealth management or wealth protection structures that can be utilised, including but not limited to companies, trusts and pensions. The important thing in determining which wealth management structure is appropriate is to look at a number of factors for each player. Things which may influence an appropriate wealth management structure include things such as personal circumstances, where is the player resident, where is the player domiciled, whether access to funds generated by the exploitation of image rights is required, or whether funds will be allowed to roll up um, for use at a future date. The flexibility of the vehicle from an investment perspective might also be important. And finally, in terms of how benefit is taken, you may well find that a regular inc income might be required in later life, um, or indeed, on a more ad hoc basis, capital payments might be more appropriate way of, 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 of structuring the, the, the passing of benefit from those structures. And of course, let's not forget anonymity. Anonymity can be particularly important in for players who come from jurisdictions where there really is a risk of kidnap and ransom for family members. So in terms of the Guernsey image, right, I think the, for both club and player, and indeed the sponsors as well, um, we can see that there's a creation, it, it assists in the creation of value through certainty. David's already touched on the fact that it creates an audit trail through ownership, uh, an audit trail of ownership, sorry. And if we analogize with um, other intellectual property um, registers, trademark and patents, for example, then if you have an asset or, or a, a trademark which is not registered, or if you have um, uh, an asset or an idea which has not been registered under the patents law, then it's very difficult to argue that you've got any value or any protection at all. Similarly, with Guernsey image rights, um, it's a world first which helps create the certainty, helps in terms of having a publicly available register where an image right um, will be shown to be registered, and it creates um, value through um, protection against infringement. Indeed, you could argue that directors of existing image right companies would be well-minded to consider whether they're doing everything in their power to protect the image rights that they own in the companies if indeed registration hasn't yet taken place. So in my opinion, and I'm sure that of David and many others in the room as well from Guernsey, um, the time is right for registering and protecting your image. 
you must register prior to an infringement for that registration to have any value in infringement proceedings. And one of the um, important questions that I get asked quite a lot is, of course, in relation to um, enforcement. Will courts recognise the Guernsey registered image right um, in jurisdictions outside of Guernsey? And I wanted to sort of address that question by closing with a, an analogy to prenuptial um, arrangements. As we all know, prenup arrangements weren't legally enforceable going back 20 years or so. And I had a conversation with, with, a, with a, a friend and, and, and colleague of mine about this. And he was advising that in the late 90s, he was advising a player about marrying um, his sweetheart. And he advised the player to take a prenup out. And the player and his agent were both strongly of the opinion that this was unnecessary given that the courts would not recognize the terms of that prenup. Of course, the time was right to enter into a prenup because it was before that player was getting married. In the event, um, and I don't know whether he's still married or not, um, but in the event, we've seen over the last 20 years or so that the attitude of the courts in relation to prenups has changed uh, in that they are now taking into account statements of intent that were entered into before marriage when coming to a judgment on divorce. So my, my proposition is, is, is simply this. It may well be the most valuable thing you do to protect your image, and you should do it sooner rather than later. Only time will tell um, uh, as, to, as to what the situation is when there is an infringement. So with that, um, I'd like to invite any questions for David and or myself. Perhaps raise the light so I can see. Hi, my name is Navneet. I'm from India. And uh, my question is, uh, for example, uh, I do understand some of the uh, points you've, uh, you've mentioned during the course of your presentation. Uh, especially in India, in, in sports, there is uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, th there are many instances of ambush marketing which happens at sporting events. And it also happens globally sometimes. Uh, how does, I, I don't know whether it would be relevant, but if it is, well, would you be able to uh, answer how this can be addressed or controlled in in the future? Probably one for you, David. When, when you're describing ambush marketing, you're, you're talking about third parties utilizing the images of, of players without there being any permission to do so. Uh, for example, say uh, Coca-Cola is, say, sponsoring the say the Olympics or FIFA or whatever, and then uh, Pepsi runs a, uh, runs a campaign saying nothing official about it, and uh, say Coca-Cola is like an on-ground sponsor, and say Pepsi is doing something on air, and gains a lot of mileage out of the whole thing. Uh, there's a thin line there. Well, um, I suspect Coca-Cola, with or without uh, image rights, would have something to say about that on their trademark rights or, or agreements that they have with, with clubs or, or uh, stadiums or, or whatever the mechanism is. I think that the key to this is that what you're able to now put onto a register is a set of things that you are unable to trademark. So if you are Coca-Cola and you can trademark all sorts of things, Coca-Cola is quite a, a sort of difficult example because they gain from uh, well-known brand protection from trademark courts. But if you're a lesser brand, you will struggle to, to register certain trademarks. And you're, you're, A, you probably wouldn't have the budget for it, and, and B, they wouldn't be recognized or allowed. So what this does, it gives you the ability to add in an awful lot of things that you may wish to protect in some way or have recognized in some way and it may spill over into the sort of things that you're talking about um, when you're talking about maybe um, you know, viral ad campaigns, something that's very short-lived. Uh, we, we were asked by um, a drinks manufacturer, not, not either of the two you're talking about, 
but they were running a uh, set of commercials for the World Cup. Clearly, there's probably a six-week lifespan for these commercials. Uh, you know, they start a week before and they end a week after. And they were just looking at creating characters. And they probably wouldn't go to the bother of having uh, trademarks or design rights for those things. They could very easily add them to a uh, an image rights portfolio and then let them lapse later because the cost effectiveness is, is there for them. So I think there's lots of scope for this. A and I think what will, will happen is that we'll see this pan out in ways that you know, the creative minds will take this into realms that we're, we're probably not uh, uh, you know, thinking of right now. Thank you. Are we wrapping up now? Sorry. Uh, 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 Pat. One more? Gentleman there? Hello. Uh, this is Isa Fakuri from Jordan. I would like to ask about the image rights, for example, that are used on the digital media. For example, a photographer uh, has shot some photos and other agencies are using those photos in their news uh, as part of the article, for example, or other commercial use. This, is, this, is, this, this happens b uh, outside UK, for example. You, you get the, the registry inside UK, but now all, everybody outside the world can see it. So any, any solutions about this or any measures? I mean, Im image rights are, are, are designed to supplement things like copyright, for example. And you know, I guess you're talking about the copyright in, 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 in of the picture in, in, in this particular case. Yeah. Um, I'll probably hand over again to David. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you have got certain exemptions, as I mentioned, about um, uh, reporting. So if it's news reporting and you're utilising an image, but I think what we're actually talking about here is is some sort of commercialization because yeah, you you're not paying for them exactly when you see a news for example yeah. ronaldo's scoring something like this then you see a google ad or a sponsorship right. on that image right. on, on well that, that page itself i think there are a multitude of different scenarios there depending on who owns those rights so there may be let's say I, i'm i'm the owner and I've seen this online. Some if you've taken the photographs or the, or the video footage yeah. and that, that is utilised elsewhere, then, there, like Paul says, there's a copyright issue, first and foremost. There may be an image rights issue, dependent upon the different relationships going on in that footage. Um, there may be uh, player, sponsor, club, national club. You know, you get this, that, that there are a whole host of different variables at work here so but all of them if, if you have a registered image right will give you more uh, ability to go after somebody than mere copyright will okay because what you are now saying is i mean the the, the thing about copyright whilst it it happens automatically upon creation you can't register it apart from the us but if you're trying to lay claim to the fact that you shot that footage, that may be quite difficult for you to prove. It is less difficult for you to prove that you have a piece of footage on a register. Because you say, that's, that's my image, it's registered. I've got a certificate to prove it. You can see it on the register. So now it's a different conversation with the infringer. Does that help? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Well, we're both on Guernsey Finance stand throughout the course of the next uh, couple of days, so if there are any more questions, feel free to pop up and either speak with David or I or, or any of the other Guernsey Finance people. And, and I've been asked to say, if you come to the Guernsey Finance stand, bring a business card, pop it in the, th in the uh, goldfish bowl, and you can win an iPad. So there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, for a very interesting presentation. I think uh, one of the things it highlights is the um, increasing importance of intellectual property in sport and the value that it represents to both athletes and to, to businesses. If you can grab a quick coffee, uh, you've got five minutes, and then we'll be starting the next session to try and uh, wrap up the day by the, uh, on time. Thank you. No one with the love and kindness, strength and courage of King Ron.